Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Cody, and I want to welcome you to Tech Tuesday at 2 in the Edmund Lowe Creative Studios. The Creative Studios are here for students to learn about and, and utilize new software and technology that can allow them to both express their creativity and help them in their success both here at OSU and in the future. Tech Tuesday occurs right here in the Creative Studios on the first Tuesday of each school month for interactive presentations on emerging and innovative technology. Last month, we learned about 3D printing and 3D modeling. To see past Tech Tuesday events, you can find them on OState TV um, or OState.TV by searching Tech Tuesday on the library's website as well. Today, we'll be, we will be learning about digital story mapping with Kevin Dyke, the maps and spatial data curator for the library. If you're watching on today's live stream, you can submit questions via Twitter or Facebook by using the hashtag LibTechTwos. Live audience members, if you have any questions, simply raise your hand and we will swing by to assist you. At the end of our program, we will be drawing for some fabulous prizes for OSU, studi OSU students here in the live audience today. So be sure to fill out a prize entry form. Kevin, take it away. All right. Thanks a lot, Cody. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's wonderful to see so many faces here, eager to learn just what the heck story mapping is, I'm guessing, in a lot of cases. So here we have a story map telling a story about story mapping. And just for the real nerds out there, in the background of, this, uh, the, uh, of my first uh, page here, this is a, a, a rotating set of what are called map projections, showing different ways of taking the 3D surface of the Earth and displaying it on a two-dimensional surface. So that is just really setting the tone for how nerdy this presentation is going to be. But you're at something called Tech Tuesday, so here we go. So when we're talking about stories, a compelling narrative is really the key thing. That's what you're after. That's the most important aspect of it. And that's uh, a compelling narrative when it comes to talking about your childhood, talking about your research, a, a term paper, a particularly interesting data set you've come across. But regardless of how compelling the narrative is, generally speaking, and this is sort of my argument here, making a narrative or a less than compelling narrative more interesting, you can always be accomplished using pretty pictures. Look how pretty that is. That's an actual photograph. My good friend Stephanie Sinclair, who I've never met, but she <laughs> has an excellent free photographs that are nicely watermarked so she gets credit. So you can, with story maps, you can take a URL to, to a, a photograph located anywhere online, you paste it in, and voila, it'll show up in the background as you're talking. You can include videos seamlessly. And this is a great video from Vox. I, I would be tempted to turn on the sound and let just everyone sit here and watch the whole six minute long thing, but I won't. And it's about that exact thing I mentioned at the beginning. So taking the 3D surface of the Earth and stretching it out to stick it onto a two dimensional surface, making a map out of it. And the, Great way this guy does it is by taking a beach ball shaped like the, uh, with a map printed on it and cutting it up and showing just how tricky it is to stretch and wrangle that thing out. So this is a great uh, example of just how rather than having a video pop up in another tab, in another browser, having to switch out of full screen mode, I just started blabbing about it as I scroll down and it's just playing in the background as we go. There's that magical word projection. I could watch that all day. And really, what's closest to my heart when it comes to story mapping is it allows you to integrate something geographical. So if you have, for example, a set of aerial images covering the city of Stillwater. So these are aerial photographs from the collection I take care of down in the basement of the library going back to 1938. And we have 
uh, in addition to 1938, 1969 in the bottom left, uh, and 1979 on the top right, 1938 is down there in the lower right, and uh, the most recent is in the top left. And if I zoom in here, let me zoom into the area around campus, and as you zoom in around, it keeps everything synced up, so you can actually see over time exactly what the same area looked like. So you can see, I usually like to use the stadium as an example. If you look at it back in 1938, it wasn't quite the uh, impressive piece of architecture that we know it as today. So as someone who uses maps a lot in my presentations, in my work, the ability to, integ to integrate an interactive visual uh, uh, map that, uh, like this uh, within a presentation without, again, having to switch out or anything like that is really, I think, a super way to go. And what's great is that as you're going, you're not, since you're not getting distracted by having to negotiate uh, uh, browsers and controls and all those sorts of things, it lets you keep the focus on what you're actually talking about. It keeps, it keeps viewers focus on what you're talking about. And that's really a, a great part of, uh, of what really makes story mapping special, I think. So when should you make a story map? As much as I love story maps, there's a, a time and a place uh, for them. And uh, sometimes it just makes more sense to make the classic PowerPoint with a white background with black blocky text on it. And that's when you're working on something two hours before you're making the presentation. So, uh, but if you're doing something like PowerPoint and you just have, I would say, baseline, if you have web links websites that you want to include, that you plan on visiting, that you plan on including in your PowerPoint presentation, rather than just pasting the link and then clicking it and then going off to see Firefox or Internet Explorer crash and burn, maybe think about using a story map. So if you have, as an integral part of, say, a research project, you have, you have images, you have videos, you have maps that you need to share, that's where a story map can be really come in handy. This is a great map that shows current wind trajectories and intensities covering the entire planet. And you can just go to this website that, I, that I've linked to here at any moment, at any time, and it'll show you what things are looking like. Uh, in the last few months with the numerous incredibly destructive hurricanes we've had, this website was just uh, a blaze in color, uh, just uh, showing the, the destructive power uh, uh, that was involved with these hurricanes. You can see the, that's another thing I could just watch all day. Or if you just want to uh, go to some sort of random website, I don't know, like uh, the website for maps and spatial data services here at Edmund Lowe Library. And I don't know, like, let's just randomly looking at the workshop settings. And oh, there's an introduction to story mapping workshop. Oh, it's this Friday. <laughs> it's, it's on Friday, everyone. So if you want to learn even more, step by step, how to make a story map, how to actually, you can bring in all of your own materials and build a story map step by step by step uh, with, my, with my, me helping you along the way, Friday, 9 a.m., just upstairs. Wow, that was just really lucky that I happened to notice that in the middle of this presentation. That's just wild. And, yeah, so if you have any, any sort of geographic content with the presentation you're trying to make, so anything, I would suggest that story maps are something that can really bring your work to life and make it uh, communicable to a broader audience. And what's really great is that uh, a story map works well and for a, a single viewer it works. The way I'm sort of pitching it is as a replacement for PowerPoint is, is sort of as a presentation piece of software. But uh, in a lot of ways it's used in uh, journalistic settings. It's used to replace just a static 
uh, New York Times column uh, web page. It's, it's a way of integrating uh, into, some, into a news story. Think about the images and maps and videos you could include in that sort of a setting. So it's not just uh, replacing your term paper presentations. Uh, it's a really flexible medium. And just, ooh, that did not translate particularly well. But what this map is showing here, this is a 3D map, so it's tilted. It's a map of Oklahoma. And those red bars, those red columns, represent earthquakes uh, that have hit Oklahoma. And the, the height of these bars is scaled according to the magnitude of that earthquake, because each, each point on the Richter scale, you know, it goes from uh, 0 to whatever, each point change is an order of magnitude greater. So that's why. This giant one here, which is the 5.8 earthquake that hit near Pawnee last year, that's why it's so much larger, because it's not just that a six magnitude earthquake is six times as strong as a, as a, point, as a 1.0 magnitude. It's, it's, it's six magnitudes of order greater than that. So this, it's a, anyway, that's just another uh, great example of what uh, the sort of content you can display and talk about and share with your audience. Now, uh, to get a little more into the weeds here, this is a, a, the story map that I'm using today to talk about story mapping. This, this meta story map that we have here is called a cascade. So that's, you can see me, I'm just scrolling, 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 and these things pop up and come and go. That's called the Cascade. But the way uh, the, com the, the website that produces these story maps, which is uh, arcgis.com, uh, there are a, a number of different options that can let you uh, create a story map that really is tailored to your uh, interests and your needs. So I'm not going to go through each of these. But there's just uh, a, 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 if you if you aren't sure where to start, and I think that covers most of us, is uh, you're not really sure where you want to start. On the main story map website, when you go down and click Create Story, there's this little button that says Ask the Pros. And what that actually does is ask you what, you're, what it is you're talking about, what you're dealing with. So we can say, oh, I want to tell a narrative. And do you want your audience to click through tabs or scroll? And if I click scroll, do you want it to fill the whole page? Do you want it to freeze and embarrass you? <laughs> and done. And in that case, that would have brought me to this cascade option, which is where you're scrolling through. You have a full screen sort of immersive experience. Uh, we'll talk about the, the, the map tour uh, option a little later, which is great if you, say, have a uh, set of photographs from a trip that you took that you want to display on a map along with an accompanying description. We'll take a look at that later. That's uh, just one of the other options available with story maps. So that's really the nitty, uh, the, 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 the really broad strokes overview of what's involved with uh, story mapping. Now. I want to get a little more interactive. And while not exactly a story map, this is the kind of thing uh, that you could easily use when you're telling a story using maps. This is a way to tell your personal story using your own personal location data. And so if you use Google Maps and you have location history turned on, Google will actually provide you with a uh, a, a download of all of the location data that you've recorded uh, using your handy dandy mobile phone. So if we go to maps.google.com slash timeline, and if you want to follow along, that's fine, but you don't have to. So here, you can see I'm logged in here. If you log in, that's cool. If I click on menu, and if you go on down, you'll see your timeline. Click on that. And if you have location history turned on, 
you'll, you'll see something like this. You'll see a number of places, you'll see a number of dots on the map. Hopefully it won't look exactly like mine because that means you're probably stalking me or something, so that, uh, we don't want that exactly. But what this means is that you have the, the material that you need to work with. So here we can see, let's see, where have I been today? And very excitingly, I've gone from home to work today. And that's it. One really cool thing, let's see, you can set the type of activity. So here I'm going to set it to driving. And once you set it to driving, you can set it to snap to the road. And then here it says hyperlapse unlocked. Congratulations. And what's really cool is once you've snapped your location uh, trajectory to a road, and it says that hyperlapse thing, and you hit play, you might not be able to see that, but it takes you through a step-by-step -step Google Street View of your little of your path. So we're just wa we're looking at my uh, journey that I take to work every day using Google Street View. And that's pretty wild. <laughs> I think it's it's you may be creeped out. All right. <laughs> but this is the sort of thing that you opt into and that you have some amount of control over. And that, for me, makes a big difference. I know with Apple, with their Maps product, they also keep tabs on your location so that they can offer services to improve your general experience. But Apple doesn't offer an option to easily download a zip file containing a uh, well-structured JSON file that I can then use and upload to create a heat map. Hint, hint. So anyway, that's this is just Google Maps timeline. This is what you can have, you can do uh, if you have location history turned on. And if you don't have it turned on, uh, you'll be surprised at how quickly this stuff adds up. So if you, I, I, if you aren't freaked out by it, I'd say give it a shot because it's really kind of fun. So that's if you do have your your history turned on. You might not. Now. If you don't have it turned on, it'll look like this. It'll just be blank. It'll say location history is off, and that's OK. Now, since I have mine turned on, I'm going to go through the process of downloading it just to show everyone here and everyone at home, or wherever you are, uh, where, uh, how to go through it. But if you know for sure that you don't have location history turned on, but you want to still make a cool heat map along with me here, you can go to this URL right here, which I should make bigger, but it's bit.ly slash story mapping one. And I'll just copy and when you enter it in, it'll look like this, which I, I wish it wouldn't do that. I wish it would just show the, 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 the hiding it thing because that looks bizarre. But what's really important is that you can download it. So once you enter it in, just click download. That blank screen keeps freaking me out. <laughs> and then save it. So we'll save it to downloads. So it's called location history example dot json, J -S -O -N. And you'll see that's a, a beefy 16.4 megabytes, which for just a bunch of text is kind of a lot. So anyway, for anyone who has their location history turned on and, want, and you want to download yours rather than a, a small sample of my location history, what you need to do is go back to the timeline And you go down to the little gear. You say, download a copy of all your data. And my large head might be in the way. 
but I can't do anything about it. I'm sorry. So that takes you to this download your data page. And this, just FYI for anyone using Google out there, this is where you can pull nearly everything out of your Google life and, and download it and take it somewhere else, delete it, back it up. It's really, it's a nice service that Google provides. But what we're interested in is location history, JSON format right here. We don't want all this other stuff. So I'm going to click this button that says select none. Scroll all the way down to location history. Turn that on. Scroll all the way to the bottom. Click next. We'll just leave all these options as is. And then click create archive. And then we'll just sit here and stare at each other while we wait for it to complete. It really doesn't take long. This is assuming uh, it says it might take some time. But I, I think that's assuming people are downloading their Gmail archive, which uh, in my case is, a de is 12 years old, and I've never deleted an email ever. So that uh, is a little different. So I'm going to refresh. Failed. Uh-oh. OK, there we go. And uh, within a few minutes, oh, it failed. Oh. Well, being the stalwart, not afraid person that I am, I'm going to try again. So select none, location history, next, create. I think I just need to leave this alone. I got too fiddly last time. So we will just take bite our time. And just for fun, I'll show you yesterday, I was in Chicago. I was in Indiana, drove to the airport at 5 o'clock in the morning with my three-year-old son in tow, got to Midway, flew to Oklahoma City, got in our car, and drove home. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> what will it do for the time lapse for your flight? It, won't, it can only do it for driving, okay. which is, it, it's OK. It, I, I wish, because I oftentimes ride my bike to and from work and just kind of around town, and I would really like to see like, the street view version of my bike ride. But it doesn't. I think because sometimes you go off the street it only does it for driving just to, but, but I agree, I was, and flying would be really cool, just throw a camera on the nose of a plane. I guess it might be pretty dull. It failed again? Hmm. Well, I don't know why that's failing. I'm going to carry on. It's worked for me multiple times in the last few weeks. But I had that download, uh, that other download. So I'll just use that one that I mentioned the, uh, at bit.ly slash storymapping1. So here are all those instructions if you want to go back and try it on your own. And then. We have uh, this website here, which is okstate-maps. Sorry. okstate-maps.github.io slash location history visualizer. Now that is rather long. I realize I should have shortened it. So I don't blame you if you don't want to continue on. But what I'm going to do, let's visit that tab. It's actually right here. So what you need to do, it sounds like there's a virus spreading through the room. <laughs> so. 
So at this website here, which is what I mentioned before, you browse to the file called locationhistory.json, in this case, location history example. Click open. It'll take a little bit of time to make it grow. And this thing, I should mention, this visualizer, it, doesn't, it does not store your data. It doesn't do anything. All it does is in your browser. So I, even on your local computer, it just, it just takes it, processes it, displays it to you. And when you close the website, it's gone. So that, that's something you don't need to worry about. So when I click Launch Heat Map, there you see it's a limited thing. It's only 75,000 GPS points. My full one, when I did earlier, it was something like it was close to 800,000 individual points. And this is going back to just 2014. And that's, it's a, it shows you just how much data is being gathered here. So here, I can zoom in. I moved here from Minneapolis about a year and a month or so ago. And this is from 2014 when I was living in Minneapolis. So here you can see right here is where I lived. And then I worked right here. And well, actually, this is our neighborhood liquor store right here. <laughs> it's really embarrassing that it's like the brightest thing on this map. That shows you I was in graduate school at the time, so I uh, <laughs> So I don't uh, take any responsibility for that. <laughs> By comparison, this is our grocery store <laughs> right here. So you can see, and you can actually you can tweak the size of the points. So you can make them really big. You can make them blur less or more. You can make them fade in, fade out. You can make the map fade out, fade in. So that's really kind of a cool thing just at your fingertips. But what's really, really cool about the location history file that you can download from Google, it not only down, it gives you that location, it gives you the time, the almost exact time it happened, as well as the uh, accuracy of the GPS when it captured that point. So if it's something like, oh, you were in a concrete bunker, and we think we're, you're within uh, half a mile of this point, it'll tell you that versus I know that you're within 50 centimeters of this particular of this exact point. Uh, it'll let you know that. And it'll also take a guess at what you were doing at that time. So that's where, uh, when I showed you the whole driving thing with our little guided tour through uh, Stillwater, that's because the spacing of the points, Google just algorithmically guesses because they're spaced this far apart, you're in a car. Uh, uh, if, you're, if they're much closer, it would probably say, well, you're walking or you're on a bike, uh, and so you can, you can, it has a lot of information built into it that you can then use to explore and do some really cool stuff. For example, this is a time-lapse video of me around town. Let me zoom out. And so you can see it's just going through time, and each of those points is me scooting around still water. And let me, so if I move back here, that's where I used to live. There's work, there's work, there's work. Then I started working on a new house that we bought. And then right there, my daughter was born. And so there I am at the hospital. And we go back, and then I'm just all over the place buying who knows what and, and getting various things. So that, and what you can actually do here is pull segments. So here I picked from April 12th to April 17th of this year, threw that on the map. Here I'll go from just on the 17th, what happened. 17th to the 18th. So there you see it's using that embedded metadata, that, that additional information that's in this file to let you slice and dice and see what's going on here. Here's just one more representation of showing, instead of just points, of starting and connecting the dots. And you can see this is not ideal. You can, this is where filtering by the accuracy would be helpful. But it's going and time after time connecting from one dot to another, showing where you are. And you can see it's just all over the place. 
that's a fairly good start. Okay. So now, so that's enough of the creepy privacy invasion aspect of today's presentation. Now I want to talk a little bit just about how you can map your own photos. How you can take, well, I guess it is a little creepy. Everything to do with location is creepy. I've accepted it. I just go with it. Here's a beautiful picture of a butterfly. What could be wrong with that? Uh, we're going to take photos that have latitude and longitude coordinates embedded within them. Uh, so if you take a picture with your phone, more likely than not, it's storing the, uh, the GPS coordinates of where you took that picture, unless you explicitly tell it not to. And if you don't believe me, there's a website here, and here's a photo link. What I'll do is add this link, click Submit, And here, just over here on the right, is all the information that's embedded just with that simple JPEG image. So it's, it's really remarkable what they do gather. But right down here is really what I'm interested in. It says GPS position, 36 degrees north, 97 point something something uh, west. So that means that's where this picture of this butterfly was taken. And when you have enough photos like that, that have the uh, location in there, that lets you pretty quickly make a story map showing all those photos and, and, and making a little tour of, uh, of your photos. And that, this is just all that information. Holy smokes. So what I want to do next is go to storymaps.arcgis.com. Again, this is, if you want to follow along, that's fine. If not, you don't have to. Uh, and then we'll scroll down here. There's this button that says Create Story. This is how we get started. I'll just pick an app. We want to pick Map Tour, where it says Guide People Through a Sequence of Places. That sounds good to me. Now at this point, it'll have you log in if you aren't logged in. And if you aren't logged in, you can log in using, uh, if you're a student and you have Gmail here, you can use your student account and, and use that to link with uh, ArcGIS uh, to create a story map. Or you can create a separate account. Or you can just follow along uh, and just watch me. So what we're going to do is look at an album that someone uploaded to Flickr. And this I found just by poking around on Flickr. So click Flickr. The user's name is G Medor, so G M E A D O R. Click look up. And then under photo set, we're going to scroll down. And actually the 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 way I like to do it is hit O multiple times. Cuz he has a whole lot of photos this guy. No, M. I'm sorry. It's mapping, mapping Osage State Park. Mapping Osage Hills. So you want to pick Mapping Osage Hills. Just anyone would work more or less. But this one just works shockingly well, quite honestly. So I pick Mapping Osage Hills, click Import, and it'll bring up this little thing showing to locate and located. So what that means is if you selected an album and they didn't have that GPS information in there, you could just go through and then click on the map where that photo was taken manually, and that's how you could do it. But in this case, this guy, he has all these photos. They have the GPS information, and there they are. And so here you can see there's a map of them already there. So I'm just going to click Import. So we didn't have to do anything. So I'll click Import. <clears throat> We're initializing the tour, and here you see this is the creation, uh, the editor window for working with creating a story map tour. So here you see his, uh, his picture in downtown Bartlesville in the fog. And you can see it has a title for the photo, it has a description of the photo, and they're slotted in right there because it's pulling that information from Flickr 
which, he, uh, which the photographer entered in and integrating it into our map. So here you can see, you can zoom in. And we'll wait for it to load. We'll keep waiting. I'll be patient. And we'll just move on because that's how things are going, and that's OK. But what you can do is uh, the little arrows here at the side, click Next. And here, Disco Balls Buffalo. Wow. Click Next again. I'm going to try changing the base map. Nothing is really working. Let me pull out a little further. Hmm. OK. Ooh, I think I'm hurting this computer. Uh, and so here, we'll just keep going through. It shows you there down at the bottom. These are all the photos in your tour. You can rearrange them so you can take a set of whatever, how many photos. You can order them in the way that you want, to, want someone to proceed uh, uh, chronologically through your photos and, and talk about them. So it's all there. You can add more. You can import a whole other album. So you could bring together multiple albums if you wanted to and create a cohesive story. And so here, this is something that I think, uh, I think about, uh, for example, a wildlife biologist or someone working uh, in uh, Agronomy, even any any of the uh, like a field science where you're doing a lot of where you have field work and you're taking photos and you're working out in the real world and you want to talk about it you want to share your findings with a broader audience this is the sort of thing that would really really nail uh, uh, really get home what your findings are and and what's uh, the significance of your research uh, without having to do a whole lot as you can see. Especially when the internet is working normally, because then it's really awesome. So that's um, uh, that's how you can make a story map tour using a, a set of photos. That, as I showed you, I just found this random guy on Flickr, imported one of his albums, and here we go. So let me go back to my story map, and those are just directions for what I just did. And one last thing I want to show you is how you can find more geotagged photos on Flickr. And all this is is a, it's a Google spreadsheet that I've created. And this, this link here, and uh, we'll post the link to this story map uh, uh, on the Tech Tuesday website. It'll be up there. And you can get to this. But this is bit.ly story mapping 2. And if you make a copy of that spreadsheet, what you can do then is uh, we can search Flickr and get a really nicely formatted list of photos that have those GPS coordinates in there. So for example, what I did was I, I clicked and things broke. Hang on. We're OK. I'll move back in time. Forward in time? Yeah. Found me a bug. So what you can do in this uh, with this spreadsheet, what you can do is enter in your search information, so this is just uh, keywords. So whatever you want to search for, you can set in a date. So if you only want to find photos from the most recent year, whatever, you can put that in there. You can put a latitude and longitude. So if you, only, if you want to find photos that are uh, geotagged within a given area, you can find them that way. Uh, you can search by license, which I know uh, is important in terms of wanting to reuse photos. You can find Creative Commons. You can find public domain. Uh, or you can find copyrighted things. And you run that search. And 
And if I don't, and once it gets going, it will actually spit out a list of uh, photos. And it looks just like a bunch of uh, spreadsheet rows. But here you see there's lat long and the time taken. So we have the time and the place for each of these photos. And then you can click, and this is the URL for that photo. So let's see, where is this? Amphitheater of some sort. Does it look like it's uh, OSU? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, and what's really, uh, and this is just sort of a general thing, but if you have, uh, and then there's this plain URL, so let's see, G2, and if you didn't, you might not know, but in Google Spreadsheets, if you have a URL that you want, if you have an image that you want to include and you have an, a URL for it, you can do a function. So equal sign image, and I have G2 is the, it'll actually pull that little image and plop it into your Google spreadsheet. So that's, uh, and we could just actually copy and paste these and pull all those images just to, if you want to check them out basically is why you would want to do that. But the real use of this particular tool is that you can then download, I could download this Google spreadsheet and you have all that location data. You have the links to the photos at your fingertips. And, do, and w use that, using that, you can then go ahead and do something extremely important, like making a map of people who uh, dedicated photos to David Bowie and Prince after they each died a couple years ago. So here you see, this is a really stupid map I made. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I was a very large David Bowie and Prince fan, so it was just, it was a terrible year for me. But what I did with this map is the, the, the red dots are photos about David Bowie, the purple ones obviously are Prince. And so what happens, and you can see my adopted hometown, Minneapolis, for anyone who doesn't know, that's where Prince was from. It's a bastion of purple. And what happens is when you hover over each of those dots, it actually pulls the map. Music icon, dead at 57. Tragic. So here, it, it, it's, this is making a map, taking, this is just using that spreadsheet that I showed you from that other thing. I downloaded it, uploaded it to this other website, and, and made this thing. And uh, let, me, let me find a good David Bowie one before we move on. Oh, no. I keep ending up there for some reason. I... Okay, I'm not going to go. I'll spare you the David Bowie. Oh, just kidding. I need to show you at least one David Bowie one. That wouldn't be fair. Let's see, up here in Canada, in Montreal, this is a poster of a David Bowie performance. So not so much a, uh, there's the Stardust, Modern Love, good stuff, okay. But that, so you could punch in anything into that search and get, uh, so this actually has some sort of research purposes or, or, or school purposes. If you have an essay or a paper or something about that's centered on a place, you can find, uh, I found someone who, uh, I was working with someone who does ancient architecture, and they knew a bunch of keywords for that, and they put those in here, and they were able to basically create a map showing uh, different uh, uh, sites of ancient architecture uh, to use in their classes just with uh, a few searches on this thing. So that is another way of telling a story, in a way. And that's basically everything I wanted to tell you about. One last thing. Again, if you want even more of this uh, poorly constructed and, and, and faulty uh, presentation, come to my workshop on Friday. We have much faster internet, and it will be really outrageous, and we can make all sorts of fun maps together. 
uh, you can register on the library's website and Friday, 9 to 11, upstairs. And I would love to answer any questions you have. And if anyone ever wants to make a story map and wants my help or advice or whatever, please get in touch. My email address is kdyke at okstate.edu. Uh, and I would love to hear from any of you. Or come on down to the basement. The library does have a basement, if you didn't know that. And we're on the north side. So any questions? Oh, yeah. That is a good question. It's the Earth Wind Map. Let's see, I can't remember. Earth.nullschool.net. So Earth.nullschool.net. So here you can see, you can even zoom in. So here's some action off the coast of Spain and Portugal. So I basically just set this to my, uh, that's just my screensaver. Should be, but there you go. Anything else? You can, yeah, you can, uh, it would kind of be the, so you would have a domain name, like your own personal thing, and you could embed a story map within that. That would be the way to go. And it's, they make it pretty easy to do, as long as you could embed iframes, uh, you can do it. Anything else? All right. Thank you, everybody, for your questions and discussion. If you want to learn more about the resources the Creative Studios and the library have to offer, you can visit the staff in the Creative Studios or check out the library's website and search for Creative Studios. If you have ideas for future Tech Tuesday at 2 topics, you can tweet us um, using the hashtag LibTechTues. I also want to mention the Library Creativity Award. All OSU students have a chance to showcase their creativity and win awards in 2D, 3D, motion, and wildcard and best in show categories. You can visit our website or ask any of the event staff if you would like to learn more about those. Now we're going to say goodbye to our live stream audience and draw for prizes. Thank you to Oste O State TV for hosting the live stream and thank you to all who watched. <laughs>